Here we go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, on this uh, suddenly damp afternoon where it's been fairly dry and warm. So in a way, it's quite pleasant. Uh, welcome to the uh, September 23 meeting of the Governance Risk and Audit Committee. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I see we've got a visitor at the back, so I'll cover that in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you, everybody, who's here this morning to, to help us get through the agenda, and that's appreciated. The uh, please um, do the usual. Make sure your phones on silent or off would be preferable. Councillor Brown, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, and, and yeah, so that's great. And then also fire precautions again because we've got a visitor. Uh, you can see the fire exits to the ends of the room. Uh, just follow directions. Don't use the lift and out into the car park where officers will will round you up. Thank you. Um, so being as we've had some updates to the agenda, if we can just work together today to make sure we're on the same page, so to speak, because I've got notes on both versions. And so, um, yeah, we may need to work together just to get to the right place that we're all talking in the same area. So I thank you for your patience with that today. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, just ask if, um, rather than go around and everybody introduce themselves, the first time that people speak so that our guest knows who we've got here and who the players are, if you could just introduce yourself when it when we get to your, when your first time you speak, I think that's the easiest way. Thank you. Rather than uh, waste time doing that. So thank you. So to the agenda, get the right page John. There we go of which there are several. So, starting off then, apologies for absence. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just uh, start by introducing myself. I'm uh, Matt Stemperich, Democratic Service Officer. Uh, we have apologies from uh, Emma Spagnola as a member of the committee. I don't believe we have any substitutes uh, to fill her space. And um, we also have apologies from Tina Stankley, the Section 151 Officer. Okay, thank you, Matt. Any substitutes? No, just the one that we've spoken about. Thank you. Any public questions? I'm received. Okay, thank you. Items of urgent business? Again, I'm received. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, declarations of interest? No, any declarations from interest? Or on any items on the agenda? No, I see none. Thank you. So, the minutes. Uh, do um, Does anybody have any comments on the minutes? So, thank you. Council Cushion. Oh, when are we introducing ourselves, Mr. Chairman? Are we doing it now or later? No, just do it now. Just first time round. Uh, great. Thank thank you. You. Uh, my name is Christopher Cushing. I'm the uh, leader of the Conservative Group uh, and a long-term member of this panel as well. I think. So, yes, um, longer indeed. than most of us. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, if I can go to page eight, um, there is an action there for the DFR to prepare a chart timetable to show the annual account sign of schedule for yep. the years listed there. I don't recall seeing one. I don't know whether you've seen that. Yeah, we did have one come out, but again, it's it's slipped again. Matt, I don't know if you can add into that for us, thank you. Uh, I can, I would note that I've not seen sight of that timetable either. I think it may have only been sent to John. Yeah. Um, so appreciate that needs to go to the wider committee. Having said that, um, it, it didn't provide as much clarity as I'd hoped, I think. No. No, so I, I think if we just follow up on that again. I have to say, Mr. I would. So, okay, I think, yeah, I think uh, Officer Blacks can answer that for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Blatch, Chief Executive. Um, Mrs. Stankley did attend a um, part of the call, uh, Leveling Up and Housing and Communities um, briefing in this matter on the 1st of august and i understood had circulated some revised timetables so there is a national the issue around um local authority audits has been the subject of uh, national consideration um and um there is a new timetable that has been agreed uh, nationally uh, the provisional statutory deadlines that would apply to north norfolk district council is that for accounts for 2021 sorry 20 and 21 um and 21 and 22 the deadline is the 31st of march 2024 although your external auditor mark hodgson from ernst and young is here to speak to the 2021 accounts um today so we would be uh in a, in ahead of um that that deadline um and the accounts for 2023 20 uh, is the 30th of september 
24 and 23, 24, 31st of March, 25. Um, so this is an issue that is being considered at a national level. I don't think we are behind the curve in terms of the dates that are detailed here, but it might be that Mr. Hodgson can comment further. Mr. Hodgson, would you like to add anything to that at all? Thank you. I can embellish it. So Mark Hodgson, audit partner, Ernst & Young. Um, so the chief executive is right. There is a lot of discussion going on since the ministerial letter, which was issued, I think, on the 18th of July. Um, all that work is continuing. I don't think from our perspective, those backstop dates have formally been agreed. They're out for consultation currently, but we would not expect them to move from the dates that the chief executive said. But there is still quite a lot of work to do for all audit providers to see how the essence of the ministerial letter is worked up and can then be deployed across all audits across the multiple years that are outstanding. Thank you. So just to confirm to you, I have had sight of those those meetings, you know, that, that uh, they've gone on and the papers that have come from that and the procedures they're going through, but as Mr Hodgson says, there's still work to be done to finalise some of that at the national level. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. At the moment, I'd be I think it'd be helpful for all of us just to have an indicative idea of what those timescales would be. I mean, obviously, the, okay. the greater the delay, the more the concern, the more the, the impact might be on the current year's accounts. So I think that would okay. be helpful. I, I mean, I, I would need to, I don't know if anybody can advise me, would it be okay for me to share that email with people? I don't suspect that there's anything that would be an issue. Anybody? Thank you, Mr. Rose. I'm looking at the email now. I don't think there is any reason that it can't be shared with members of the committee. It is a note from the director for resources rather than being anything official, but it did follow uh, Minister, local government Minister Rowley's letter, as Mr. Hodgson has said, of the 18th of July, acknowledging on behalf of government that there were some significant delays in the audit processes nationally of local government audits. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get that shared with you so you can at least see that. Would that be helpful? Yes. Thank you. Please. Um, on page 11, um, last time I raised a concern about the, uh, or a concern was raised about the reconciliations um, being done in the new finance system. I just wonder, has that actually improved now? Again, I don't know. Can, is there anybody able to answer that for us? That was where we've gone to the new finance system. I think I'd have to um, provide a written answer or follow up to that. I don't have that information with me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We will follow up on it. Though. Thank you for raising it, Christy. Well, if I may, but I'll leave that till we get to the risk section, if you can. So I, I can be covered. Okay. They're not part of the minutes. It's fine. That's great. Thank you. Is there anything further on the minutes from anybody? No, I had one question just to, to round it off for us because we um, we brought the uh, the refuse vehicles finance through us uh, last meeting. I just wondered if uh, part of that was to to get early dates. I wondered if anybody had any idea if we've got a date yet. So when they if we'd managed to get an early slot, I don't know if anybody's able to answer that for us today. No, we can, we, we we can try and find that out. Is that possible, Matt? Thank you. To get a written answer from someone, I'd just like to round that off for us, being as we brought that through early. So if there's nothing else from anybody, um, then uh, I'll sign the minutes as correct. Thank you. I'll do that now. Okay, so back to the agenda. So the external audits results report, which was the new one that we got in. So, Mr. Hodges, would you like to introduce that? Thank you. Sure, no problem. So, we presented our audit results report to the 6th of December 22 committee with the expectation of signing off the 2021 audit by Christmas last year. Clearly, it's a little disappointing and frustrating that's taken another nine months for us to get to today's position. So, this report is our final report. And whilst the December meeting gave the chair of this committee delegated authority to approve the financial statements, 
in my view, given the elapsed time since that meeting and indeed a change of membership on this committee, I think it was worth bringing an update report to you so you can discharge your duties and give the chair appropriate um, assurance for his role. So given that I had presented one version of this in December, I'm going to focus on what has changed since and take it as that you've read the majority of the report, so I'm happy to pick up questions on any other aspect at the end. But in summary, in our December report, we reported that there were three adjusted differences. And they're clearly quite a lot more now as a result of the work that we've concluded since that date. Most of the work that we've concluded related to property planting equipment and grant income. So the three audit differences on pages 30 and 31, which were those in December, were bullet point one on page 30 of our report. And apologies, I don't have your page number in front of me. The first bullet on our page 31 and the second bullet on our page 31. All the rest are new adjusted differences within the revised financial statements for authorization. So as you can see, our focus was around closing out property, plant and equipment and grant income areas. The majority of those adjustments in relation to property, plant and equipment emanate from um, issues with the fixed asset register and being able to reconcile it across years and testing that we did in respect of balances at the 31st of March 2021. And that fixed asset register needed a lot of work to be able to answer audit queries and provide information that was correct at the 31st of March. We are now comforted, comforted and providing you of assurance that it is now there for that year. But we do have a recommendation that more work needs to be done so that fixed asset register is fit for purpose going forward into subsequent financial years to be able to satisfy audit procedures going forward. Appreciate the officers responsible at the time of the preparation of the financial statements are not here with the council now, but cleaning up that fixed asset register to provide audit responses has led to an element of the time delays of the nine months since December. And recommendation four and five on our page 37 should drive improvement in that area. As of today, we only have our closing procedures to conclude one of which is an update on the pension fund liability as a result of the triennial report that has, again, subsequently come out and everything's a timing issue at the moment. We were expecting to have a response from officers today to be able to sign our audit opinion tomorrow, but we're just awaiting that response to come through. It hasn't yet. But we do have all the other assurances we need now, and this report takes you through those in detail against each of the risks that we have and would lead us to being able to issue an unqualified audit opinion on both the financial statements and indeed a value for money when those final assurances against the four outstanding closing procedures are gained in the next few days. So I would hope if it's not tomorrow for it to be by the end of the week, and then we can park 2021 financial year. Appreciate there's also a lot of other information in that report. I think those are the headline messages that move us from December to today, but happy to go into any of the detail behind the testing or outcome from the report for you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, th there is an awful lot in there, but but essentially um, having, having read through it and of course um as you said for for officers not being around also members weren't necessarily part of that at that time um but it, essentially most of it seems to have been uh just apart from the uh asset register which you, you spoke about most of it seems to have been about getting the right things in the right column um so it was um fairly straightforward sort of minor accounting errors was was my interpretation and i would you know welcome other people's views um, the one question that I have, so I'll, I'll go straight in before I, I, I let other members in at the moment, was to do with the um, with the pension fund um, and, and its potential effects, being as this from, from a, a few years ago, um, at, at what potentially are we looking at now? I know you can't answer that necessarily, but 
um, and you're still waiting for response on that. But are you able to to sort of quantify that a bit more for the committee to to understand um, if there's a hole now, where are we likely to be? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, quantification I can't do because that is our app. Sure. That is our outstanding yeah. procedure that we need assurance on ourselves. Yeah. But providing the context to it, I think, would help you um, as a committee understand why we've asked the question. So ordinarily, a pension fund is valued by the actuary on a three-year cycle. And the 31st of March 22 is the most up-to-date valuation of Norfolk pension fund. Now, clearly, that is a year later than this set of accounts and the balance sheet. So you may ordinarily think that wouldn't affect the 2021 set of accounts. But we have found through the work that we have done both here and in other places that the assumptions driving the actuarial valuation as part of their triennial approach have differed from the basis they used at the 31st of March 2021. And understanding what impact the difference in those assumptions would have on the balance sheet date at the 31st of March is the key audit test and therefore whether the council's pension liability is understated or overstated and by how much and it is the by how much and what impact would it have on my opinion is the question that we have and of which officers are working with Norfolk Pension Fund and their actuaries to understand the impact of and it is that detail we are awaiting to make our conclusion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, and, and actually, uh, just a, a, a slight extension to that, because it's run by county, how much control or influence do we have over that? We just get a statement from them that says what it is. Is that correct? Um, a little bit, yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So they are acting as your experts, or the actuary is acting as your experts, and it is their assumptions, but your finance team need to understand those assumptions why and how they have moved and what impact it has on your set of accounts because you are using a number from the yeah. high level pension fund and dropping it into your set of accounts and clearly being able to understand how that number has been derived is a key role for your finance team as well okay so so essentially if there's a difference in in there then we need to work out how we're going to put the extra in or or, or, or balance it out is that correct so it's it's less a funding issue it is more a balance Okay, because you're not going to pay out all of your liability in one go. tomorrow, yeah, in yeah. one go. Um, it is a funding issue for how the pension fund is put together. It just happens to be what is the value of that fund at the 31st of March, so a point in time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for that clarity. That's appreciated. So, any, anybody else? I just, no, so Chris, uh, Councillor Cushion, thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to find I me mean, that's the obvious question to ask, and out of all of this in here around yeah. that particular issue so that is the risk or, or is it just effectively an, an accounting adjustment that needs to go into a spreadsheet somewhere or, or just make sure there's no risk that there could be a liability on this council to find additional funding to make up four million or even less shortfall the question i think i'd yeah. understand thank you so yes this is an accounting at your balance sheet date as opposed to a funding of the pension fund issue because okay. the whole purpose of the triennial review is to update funding levels for the next three years to ensure that the pension fund is fully funded or as best to be fully funded. There's always clearly going to be a liability because if all the pensioners in it died tomorrow, you'd have to pay out all of the benefits yeah. that go along with that. Um, but this is funding versus accounting, and we need to understand the accounting difference. If it's not material, it wouldn't have an impact, and we can move on relatively quickly. Did, did you? Yeah. I'm comfortable with that. Go again if you've got a further question. Yeah. Sorry, Christopher. Can I just... Sorry. Uh, at time on page number five, um, you, you state down there that um, there have been times when you haven't been able to do work because of staffing shortages in the finance team here. I and mean, when time's gone by, I think we've sort of um, 
um, um, had issues with Ernst uh, and Young not having resource, adequate resource, but it seems to be now on the NNDC team. So perhaps uh, in, in absence of um, Officer Stankley, the chief executive could give us insurance that the team has got the numbers it needs now. So that's not going to be, we don't have a repetition of that going forward. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor Cushing. There is an advert out for a chief technical accountant at the present time. And Mrs. Stangley has also asked me or discussed with myself and the monitoring officer the need for an additional uh, qualified, CIFA qualified accountant uh, moving forward. And that's an issue that I'm uh, discussing and considering with her at this time. Um, you're aware of the history of um, uh, the resource that's been in the, the, that department in, in recent times, last two years. Uh, obviously, Mrs. Stankley's appointment has moved us forward significantly, and I'm confident that that can be maintained. But we we are out to advert at the present time. Okay, yeah, I, I think um, if it saves us time, because it's obviously there's several areas in the report, you know, the whole agenda today where that questions arise. But I think I, I'm comfortable that officers are addressing that. There are adverts out, and I think they're trying to to do their best to resolve that situation. We are aware of it. So I don't think that that uh, risk has changed um, in terms of us. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. One other question, please. Um, I don't have last year's report in front of me, but I have the impression there are more. The impression that there's more appearances this year that you've had to correct, and some of the numbers in there may be large, and that that might be my impression. I can't compare it with last year's. Um, is that unwarranted or warranted, and is that something we should be concerned about? He hastily tries to get last year's up in front of him so you could answer the question. Thank you. Um, from memory, I think that is an astute observation, and I think it is primarily driven by the issues we found with the fixed asset register, and the way the fixed asset register is constructed means that our testing, because it's on an asset by asset basis, has pulled out more issues because we've uncovered one issue that is then replicated for a number of assets which has almost had a multiplying effect in terms of the number of audit differences we have reported to this year. So I think whilst the sheer quantum is larger, it is contained to a relatively isolated area of the fixed asset register. So as a committee, as long as you are comfortable that work is ongoing with the fixed asset register and the cleansing process and the recommendation four and five that we have over the next six, nine, 12 months, I think you should be comfortable but clearly your fixed asset register drives the biggest balance sheet item alongside the pension fund and is clearly of key consideration for us as auditors so will be an area of focus in most audit years please manager that's 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 fine so does that mean then that this sounds like some learning on behalf of the finance team to be done there so does that mean something that they've picked up so going forward um next year when they do the next set of accounts that they would have put the whatever's in the right column in the right column so to speak yeah so, um, so mrs stankley's provided me with a note of um in terms of this meeting because she was unable to attend through prior commitment um she said that uh, she's already got a member of staff who's undertaking a review of the fixed asset register in accordance with the advice that the auditors have given so she's confident that moving forward this shouldn't be a significant issue and, and that was my interpretation of, from the report as well, was that it, it was the same issue in different places. So it, 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 so whilst it looks a lot, it's just the way that we've been doing a particular process that has had to change. So again, I think that would be my interpretation of that. Is that, do you agree with that? Thank you. It is a process issue that is then replicated across. Yeah. Yeah. a lot of assets within the register yeah. for your comfort there were six adjusted audit differences last year of which three were property plant and equipment related well related in 1920. Yeah. okay thank you all right does anybody have anything else i've got a couple more if no one else has if i may then so uh, obviously we've got um the recommendations um but so uh, do we know i, I guess um Officer Black, are you able to, as, as Officer Stankley, giving you anything about how we're going to go forward with the recommendations, or do we need to work on that and come back? Because we've obviously got the five recommendations on page 37 of the report. 
other reporting issues, it says, and there's some recommendations there, five. <laughs> So Mrs. Stankley had said that with the exception of the uh, outstanding trial and evaluation of the pension, that she believes yep. that, she, that we would be in a position to uh, sign off the accounts this week. So I believe that all of the issues that are, are outstanding have otherwise been addressed. They've been addressed. Okay, thank you. Okay. So did anybody else have any further questions? One final one then, because obviously over time, the bill's gone up. Have we budgeted for that? <laughs> I don't know who if it, who can answer that for us at all. I think it's a lot going to tops of blatch possibly. So, I mean, if not, we can get that. I don't think it's a written. I don't think it's a cost that you're able to uh, particularly challenge. So I'm sure no, no. provision has been made. Yeah. And if uh, Mrs. Dangley needs to advise you further, she'll have to do that on her return. No, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to because it has gone up considerably, which is understandable. It's, it wasn't uh, the challenge of it. It was just um, whether we put it in the budgets. Thank you. Nothing else on that agenda item from anybody? So thank you, Mr Hodgson, for coming along today and to, to getting us through the report. And um, I look forward to, to, to working with you in the future as we go through future ones. Thank you very much. You. Okay. So let's get the right agenda items. So, so that was seven. So we're now on eight, the monitor office report. What's Jordan, did you want to introduce that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Cara Jordan, Monitoring Officer. Good afternoon, members, officers and guests. Um, agenda item eight is uh, presenting my Monitoring Officer report. Uh, it is within the, the bundle of papers here. Uh, I will, however, briefly go through it and happy to take any questions afterwards. So section one is the introduction, which sets out um, that I've been appointed as monitoring officer and uh, I have uh, obligations uh, in that role. And then section two sets out the, the duties that I look at within my role. So uh, A is maintaining a lawful position for the council and reporting on contraventions or likely contraventions of any enactment or rule of law, including fraud. Uh, so just to give a, a, a brief summary of the information in that section, I've, uh, I've informed that uh, I have regular statutory officer meetings with the chief executive and the section 151 officer, the chief uh, finance officer. Uh, I have appointed a deputy who assists me, especially so in my absence. And then uh, I've commented on the information governance uh, of the council and added an appendix A, which gives information about our Freedom of Information Act requests. And for the year 22-23, we received 654 requests, which is an 8% increase roughly from the previous year. Um, I have a role under that scheme as a qualified person under section 36 of the act where um, if required, I need to give a reasonable opinion that the section 36 exemption is engaged and that's where it may prejudice uh, the council in effective conduct of public affairs or free and frank speech. But there are no requests during that period where I have had to form or consider that reasonable opinion uh, moving on, there's some information about our Data Protection Act regime, how we have a procedure for reporting any data breaches and uh, that we respond to subject to access requests for which we received uh, 29 such requests the previous year. We've had no uh, serious uh, data breaches in that period requiring formal disclosure to the Information Commissioner's Office. I also have a role under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, uh, uh, known as RIPA. Um, this is in regard to directed surveillance and use of covert human intelligence sources, often referred to as CHISES. Uh, and uh, there's some, some information in regards to, to that 
but there are no um uh, so just checking there was uh the council had one covert human intelligence source application granted and these need to go to the magistrates court uh, and that was uh, during that period and it was for a, a set and a limited period i have a responsibility under the whistleblowing policy where i'm a responsible officer to whom disclosures uh, concerning the public interest may be made and there were no such uh, disclosures made to me during that year and there's some further information in regards to the work that i have assisted in carrying out relating to our anti-fraud and counter-corruption policy and obligations in section b this relates to reporting findings of uh, maladministration and you will note at appendix b there's some information regarding complaints that were made to the ombudsman uh, during the year 22-23 just two of those uh, resulted in a finding made by the ombudsman uh, whereby we uh, paid uh, a small amount of compensation totaling in regard to the to both taken together under 400 pounds um, establish and maintain the register of members interest gifts and hospitality that's uh, section c and uh, this council holds the register of uh, interests for both the district uh, council and town and parish councils within the the district um, there's um the members register of interest is published on the uh, council's website and there's also recently a um a, pre a procedure guide and application process where any member wishes to apply for a dispensation so that they may participate and vote in meetings if they uh, receive that dispensation. Uh, we also know, now have uh, and prepared in advance of the May elections 2023 an electronic register of interests rather than just a, a simple uh, paper process which involved lots of bits of paper and email so members may now uh, 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 make their register of interests online and that is held by the council. Uh, the code of conduct the guidance uh, that we have signed up to as well sets out the requirements for members as to gifts and hospitality and there is just one entry relating to gifts and hospitalities for members and that's a appendix c of the report and similarly in regards to employees gifts and uh, hospitality the financial show year shows 18 entries and there's a copy of that at appendix d uh, as members will be aware i have a, a role in regard to investigating misconduct in respect of district parish and town councillors under the code of conduct and there's some information in this report to show that in the year 22-23, a total of 20 code of conduct complaints were received, 17 of which related to parish and town councils and three to the district council. This compares similarly to the previous year where there were 23 complaints. Um, during the assessment of complaints uh, process, um, I liaise with uh, now one of the two independent persons uh, of the council. We used to have just the one independent person, but uh, last year we, uh, we appointed two independent persons. The majority of the complaints that were assessed relate to uh, disrespectful behavior. And in the most case, no further action was taken. Uh, the other things that I would mention are uh, no need to mention anything further in E or F, G. The Town and Parish Forum meets uh, quarterly 
and consists of key district council officers, members, uh, clerks, and some parish and town representatives. Section uh, H, I've mentioned uh, just briefly previously, promoting and supporting standards of conduct through support to the standards committee. Uh, as I mentioned, two uh, independent persons were uh, appointed last year to give an external and independent view where complaints are made against councillors under the member code of conduct. And this provides greater resilience and availability to both the monitoring officer, myself, and to any member who's subject to the complaint as um, such persons may consult the independent persons. Um, and uh, I have also prepared a full procedure note and provided training in regard to standards hearings uh, for the committee. So I think the only other things that I will briefly mention is that we have a whistleblowing policy, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, work and a report to the last RAC meeting was made in regard to uh, uh, the counter fraud and corruption policy, including um, uh, obtaining some information in regard to how we sit with fraud at this uh, council. And we only located some frauds of uh, low seriousness and we undertook a fighting fraud and corruption locally checklist, which has provided us with an action plan going forward. Uh, there's other information within this report. I would just mention section N relates to exemptions to contract standing orders. Uh, 12 exemptions were in this period. And as is the, the process at every GRAC meeting, um, the last quarter's exemptions are reported to uh, this committee. Uh, there's some information in regard to the key messages and looking forward and then as i've said the um appendices are at the, the back of the report so this is for review and for notes so if any member has a question for me i'll be happy to take it. okay thank you for that and uh, for walking us through that uh, for a short while there i thought you're going to be the keeper of the acronym <laughs> we started off but uh, <laughs> um yeah it's uh, something that we all face in life i think um the um if i must may start um with the freedom of information um i mean that's two per day we're doing nearly there that's quite a workload do we are you able to tell us with the those requests are they for information that is not available that people could find if we made it easier does that make sense as a question thank you it does um to to respond to that uh, we have uh, a member of the legal team who essentially deals with uh, receipt of freedom of information requests, who works part time because of leave and weekends, it works out as I think three to four requests per day. Uh, and uh, that doesn't include the uh, subject access requests. Yeah. In regard to your, your question, yes, some of the information can be found elsewhere. Uh, under the Freedom of Information Act legislation, we're required to have a publication scheme, which we do have, and uh, often the response will be giving the requester a link to our publication scheme. Um, it is available on the website, but I think that people do tend to just ask the question anyway and sometimes it doesn't neatly fit into just the publication scheme okay thank you I just, just wanted to understand that that uh, so in effect a lot of them although it's quite a, it's quite a workload and i congratulate officers on, on dealing with that um and in fact yeah you know there's quite a lot of stuff in there that you've gone through um and so yeah i thank officers for that work but um a lot essentially in terms of the freedom of information a lot but it's just redirecting people to information that is there is that yeah uh, there is a large part of that, but yeah. sometimes the very specific questions that wouldn't necessarily be on okay. the publication scheme, or they would be something that has happened quite recently. And although it is the legal officer based in the legal section that deals with the processing and gives advice and assistance in regard to exemptions, uh, which I'm also involved in at, at, at times, 
Um, there are many officers within the council that need to be liaised with if the question relates to, say, the planning department or the environmental health department. Okay, thank you. Did anybody else have any questions? If not, I've got a few to go. I'm sure. I shall start over this side this time. Do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thank you, John. Thank you. I'm Saul Penfold, um, ward councillor for the mighty Worsted Ward, <laughs> and um, a member of this committee for at least as long as Councillor Cushing, I think, <laughs> possibly longer. Um, it's uh, maybe just a small thing. Um, Cara, thank you very much for this. Um, I'm just looking at Appendix C uh, as compared to Appendix D, and we. Um, pretty much always are um, given tickets to the Chroma show as members of the opening night. And we accept that, very many of us. Um, I have for the last few years, ought that to show up in our hospitality there as it does for officers um, who are shown accepting the same in the next um, appendix. Thank you. If a, if a member wishes to uh, have a hospitality or gift that they've accepted, noted by myself for this report, then they would need to contact myself or a member of the legal team and we collate it. However, um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of the limit in the, the code of conduct, receipt of gifts and hospitality. I think it's uh, 50 pounds, 50 pounds, it is 50 pounds. So if it's under 50 pounds, then you know, there is no obligation to report it and to, to have it written here. Sometimes, uh, though, members um, wish to report in any event, or if there's a, a particular issue, even if it is under that limit, you may wish to report sometimes. It, it probably is under £50, although we do get two tickets, of course. But partners, Officer Blanche, you wanted to add to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Cara, the monitoring office has discussed this matter with me in the preparation of her report, not least because uh, in terms of sound practice, I think it is appropriate for officers who are um, offered such tickets to make a declaration uh, in the interest of transparency. But we do have a very unique relationship in that we own the pier and the pavilion theatre. We have gone out for a tender and we have a partner that operates that facility um at no direct public cost uh, anymore um but in terms of those close working relationships in terms of the leisure contract uh, leisure manager and our facilities management team obviously uh we have this or earlier this year we did make a 300,000 pound investment in the front of house um bar replacement bar uh and uh, remodeled the toilets for the first time in 20 years so there is a very close working relationship between the authority and the provider. And in respect of opening nights, a small number of tickets is deemed not to be inappropriate um, in terms of that collaboration and good working arrangements. So, um, but in the interest of transparency, we felt for officers, it was appropriate for those to be listed. Okay, thank you. Christopher, mm -hmm. Mr. Councillor Cushion, sorry. Thank you. Uh, really following up on the uh, questions that you raised, Mr Chairman, about the freedom of information, um, I, mean, I was going to ask the monitor, are there trends in there and are there, are there a lot of things that people are regularly asking which are in the public domain? So just wonder if any, any learning could be gleaned which may reduce the number of requests in future? That could I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just having I'm just having a okay. think. Um, if something particular is going on in the news, we may have a, a glut of requests in regard to that. I'm I don't wish to say anything in particular, um, but I would say um, there aren't any anything in particular that I can think of at the moment. Um, the Freedom of Information Act is used by journalists, it's used by people in business to gain information for, for themselves, it's, gain, it's used by uh, people who have got a specific want to, want to know about something in regard to the council. We get all sorts of questions, whether it's about um, 
you know, how many exotic animals we have at our zoos to <laughs> um, all, all sorts of strange things. So I, I can't say off the top of my head that there's a, a particular trend, but if there's something that you would like me to look at in particular, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Officer Blatch. I don't know if I can provide a little bit more clarity. I think in terms of your question, I think the majority, perhaps 70% or more, are not uh, particular to the actions or policies or projects of North Norfolk District Council. Many of them are from speculative uh, journalists in terms of national trend analysis or events nationally. Um, you know, how many people, uh, how many pauper's funerals have we delivered in a year? Um, so they're sort of um, air hunter type things and those sort of inquiries. There are lots around when is your next um, contract procurement for waste or IT systems and that sort of thing. So I, I would say that I mean, I'm happy for Cara to, to provide additional information in terms of general, but those that are particular to North Norfolk are in a minority, and I would say are probably around a quarter of the inquiries we receive. Thank you. And I don't think we're no. out of step with other authorities, because many of those inquiries which I've just talked about would be to all local authorities. Yeah. I understand. So thank you. All right. Um, whilst talking trends, though, if I may, if anybody's okay. Um, in the uh, in your report, I'm, I'm talking now in the Code of Conduct Complaints Appendix F. So, for example, talking about trends there, I noticed there was quite a few that said faking them. So without you, I, I appreciate that um, in terms of those items we shouldn't you know uh, mention anything sensitive but um there just seem to be a, a run of complaints from faking them so do we do we sort of monitor that as well as as is there a particular reason why there's so many that, that's essentially the question is bits of training i think um having a look at the report I've given, rather than um, identifying the person of who course. made the complaint, yeah. I've identified the person as member of the public P. Yeah. So although that does appear to be a lot of complaints about Fakenham, it's from one member of the public yeah. about a number of um, councillors there. Uh, without talking about that matter in particular, that is not uncommon. No, okay, that's fine. No, no, someone just gets on a bit of a trend or something, and but you you obviously pick up on that. And, and the, the, yeah, okay, thank you. That that was the main point. Of that. Thank you very much. Um, so just give me a moment because I lost my notes because I skipped down there. Um, sorry. <laughs> Can sorry, just microphone and if you could just introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm Councillor Liz uh, Vickers for Lancaster South Ward in Fakenham. Just a point of clarification, Chairman, that the councillors involved in the complaints were Fakenham town councillors and not district councillors. Yeah. Councillor Cushing and I, of course, are district yeah. councillors. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, it, it wasn't a question about the complaint. It was it was about the trends and whether you know Fine. what what the processes were for that. So, th but thank, thank you. you for that clarity. Um, so just bear me a second, sorry. Uh, I had a question. Go back to me. Oh, so first of all, um, just a general thing about the report in general, which I didn't pick up at the beginning. I thought we had a standard template now, and I'm not sure that this is in that template, or do you feel it wouldn't fit to that template? I don't know. Matt can, if he needs to fill in, I believe that we have a standard template for reports now. Yeah. Yes, we, we do for committee templates rather than a, this fitting into that template. This yeah. is a, a separate report that I report on annually, which is why it isn't in that yeah. format. I, I just wanted to be clear that that, that mm -hmm. was the case. I suspected it was, but um, okay. Um, it's just sometimes handy maybe if the front page can be considered to, 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 to sort of summarise it for people, but thank you. Um, 
So there was a point I wanted to raise, and bear with me a second. Sorry, apologies, people. Uh, it was, I wanted to add something about, it was about the looking forward. No, see if I can find a page, apologies. It was at the end of the report, not in the appendices. My screen's not scrolling properly. So, uh, looking forward, yes. Yeah, so it's on page 11 of your report, um, item four. So that's page 81. That? Yeah. So one of the things that we, we, we spoke about um, previously, something that um, Ovi and Scrutiny have talked about, is about the simplification and presentation of financial information. Um, and whether, I just wanted to raise it here, that may be more suitable uh, in another part of the agenda. Um, but I think that's a, a critical thing for people's understanding. It's the one thing that members are legally responsible for is financial decisions and given the light of everything that's gone on recently. So I wondered if that was something you wish to include that um, in sort of your, your looking forward, um, something to give some consideration to, because uh, I think it's important. I don't think members always grasp the complexities of, of financial information. So thank you. I think um, my report is, is as okay. is. Um, however, I do note what you're saying and you will um, or members will see that additional finance training for officers and members is something yeah. that we're looking forward. Um, I understand that there is already a further session for this committee in regards to additional finance training and we're currently putting in place some finance training for, for officers so that is something that could possibly be uh, looked at in those yeah. sessions yeah uh, I, yeah yeah I, I would like to, to to make sure that's just included that's all i just wanted to raise it again just want to keep it on the agenda i'm sure you understand that thank you um so finally uh my last bit let's say anybody else i seem to be but uh so it's about um contract procedures and, and rules and exemptions it's not specifically about an item but I noticed we have a few that there's only one bid. So whilst I accept that there's not the people out there to bid, then we have to go with that. I just wanted to try and get um, an officer's view on um, if there's only one supplier, do we feel that um, it prohibits you in any way getting the best for the council? Now, I know you obviously, as a monitoring officer, only keep an eye on it and record it. Um, and so maybe you're not the best person to answer that. I don't know if Officer Blatch can, but it's a question of if we've only got one person bidding, does that prevent us doing as well as we think we could do? So, um, Our contract procedure rules do look at that situation and we have guidance in regard to what officers need to do in yeah. such a situation. So depending on the level of the potential contract would depend um, how that officer would deal with it. So if it's a, a higher amount of money, then they would need to contact myself and the section 151 officer for a view before entering yeah. into such a contract. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And I'm happy that those procedures are there. I, it, it, it's, it's, I guess even possibly anecdotal, but do we feel that as a council, if we didn't have one bid, if we had three or four people bidding, we would do better? That's kind of the question I'm trying to get at. Um, do we feel that that's potentially driving our costs up? Does that make sense? Am I, you know, it's, it's not something you can answer directly, I, but, but officers who are experienced might be able to help us just understand that. So I don't, don't know if I can assist, Chair. So in Thank terms you. of a number of the uh, exemptions which have been applied here. Uh, the monitoring officer has said that the council has um, updated and refreshed uh, its um, procurement exemption processes in the uh, in 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 response to previous shortcomings that were uh, reported in that space by 
uh, both internal and external audit. I consider that the council now has got a robust framework in place, which the monitoring officer has independently um, described. So the list here has gone through that process. There are some uh, contracts listed here where uh, we have very specialist requirements, such as private water supplies, where there wouldn't be very many people uh, in, involved or who are able to, to do in that in a responsive way. Uh, there is an exemption sought around FMG to support the uh, levelling up fund bid for Fakenham, and we sought that exemption because we'd worked with that company in respect of um, the successful delivery of the reef and there was very limited time between the call for bids in March and the submission date of, of early July. In terms of, I, I think we are able to demonstrate value for money. The exemption does require us to consider what is a reasonable price for the supply. I think the area where I think that perhaps there is um, more scope for questioning value for money is often in terms of IT systems and licenses. Okay. The number of, um, I see that uh, Faye Haywood is, is nodding, the number of local government providers now for um, finance systems, planning systems, environmental health systems and election systems is continually shrinking such that I think in most of those spaces there are only two or three players who provide robust IT systems across those and you know people may say is there um, arrangements or a cartel approach but the actual opportunity to go out to competition on those and have the confidence that there is a product there that can meet uh, requirements mm -hmm. is something that is very challenging and to go with a small provider that is untested that may deliver a cheaper price carries a very significant risk because if we can't collect council tax or as a returning officer or the electoral registration officer I don't have confidence in the system that allows people to um, exercise their franchise you know that is career defining for some officers in terms of collecting council tax or um, you know having systems around uh, IT security and data breaches so I, I think that the market and the confidence and the reliability of some people operating in that space is very restricted. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, clearly we've got a lot of procedures in place that, and, and they're working, you know, and, and that's why we have this committee so, and we can't actually correct that. But I, I just wanted to, to feel how that was, you know, affecting us as a council. It's not something we can directly influence, but I thought it was important in the context of what we're doing. Off yeah. Jordan, thank if, you. if I could just add one other thing. Uh, I think something that uh, helps in not just being left with one option is to uh, go out to see who may be able to provide those services as much in advance as possible when uh, officers know that they're going to need to procure something. Yeah, um, yeah. and we've started to put something in, in place now so that or, or improve our system so that when a contract is coming to the end, uh, depending on the size of the contract, officers uh, have it diarised and the procurement officer knows to let those officers know well in advance. Yeah, thank you. No, that's, that's good. Thank you. All right. Um, unless anybody else has got anything on there, just to thank um, Officer Jordan and the team again, that's an awful lot that's in that report and we can see there's a considerable number of items there that create quite a little number of work and thank them for that thank you okay so moving on so we're now i think it's nine yeah item nine the grac annual report uh matt Stenberg. yep uh so this report uh you're required to recommend to full council for approval uh provides an outline of the the role and purpose of the committee a uh, summary of the work that was taken under uh, or throughout 2022-23 uh, and identifies any key issues. Uh, one of those has already been uh, spoken about at length today with regards to the external audit delay, so I won't go into that. Um, the second one there is about uh, long outstanding internal audit recommendations. I think the committee has taken quite a, 
a significant step forward on those over the past two years, um, working with internal audit to increase the frequency of follow-up reports um, and also call in officers that do have those outstanding recommendations. We will, of course, look at those uh, later in the agenda to see where we are. Um, just a, a few things to draw to the attention beyond that. Um, again, I think uh, in the financial and resource implications, just to note that uh, the finance team is, is looking to increase its uh, resource, which, which obviously has a financial implication, which has been considered. Um, and I think there was one or two um, little uh, typos in here, which just needed corrected. So I think in 5.1 uh, corporate priorities, uh, I just put 2023 to 23. Obviously, I meant to say 22 to 23. So I'll have that corrected before it goes to full council. Um, and then there was just one other thing on the number of apologies and substitutes. Uh, I think it's a very small committee. Uh, you meet only uh, four times a year, um, unless you have that additional meeting in July. So there are, I suppose, um, apologies were given on five occasions. So you could say there's technically been uh, an average of, of one apology per meeting uh, and only two of those occasions were covered by substitutes. So I suppose to, to stress uh, to group leaders, two of which we have in the, in the room today, that uh, probably more emphasis needs to be placed on, on substitutes to cover meetings. I note that uh, when Emma Spagnola gave her apologies today or for this meeting, uh, I did see and asked her to, uh, to request substitutes. So an email went out to all substitutes, not a single one of them replied. So that's something uh, that we need to see addressed. Uh, perhaps, perhaps that's something that could be done by group leaders and, and come down. Um, that's everything I was going to say about the report, unless there's any questions. Like I said, it's just a, a report required of the committee to go to full council to give wider members that are not on the committee and don't attend meetings uh, a summary of what was uh, what was done throughout last year. Thank you. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, yeah, um, so, um, yeah, Councillor Adams, why not? Thank you. If you just John. introduce yourself. Yes, of course. I'm Tim Adams. Um, I'm not a member of this committee. I'm leader of the council, so just sitting in to observe. Um, I just wanted to touch on this point uh, about um, uh, difficulty in, you know, getting members to attend the committee, which I know has, of course, been affecting Avian's recently as well. Um, I just think we perhaps both need to to monitor this issue. Because we, I mean, one one fact that, you know, we should be supporting, of course, um, is across uh, all, all groups, all three groups of the council. We do have more working, full-time working councillors this time around. So, you know, perhaps there's some adjustment we might need to consider, at least, if not make it might be quite challenging for us to do that but it's something perhaps you know i think we're, we're looking at a pool of councillors that perhaps have have working commitments and it will be quite difficult for them to to sometimes attend so uh, it's not an action for now but we can have a conversation offline thank you yeah i i, I think um i think that the um yeah i i, I was going to raise that point anyhow that more people are working um I think the lack of response is something that that we can all address. Um, that, that at least, even if you say no, we know that people have have responded to it. I think that would be helpful. Councillor Penfold, I do I do agree with that, but it is I think difficult <clears throat> if you get an email on the day yeah. to necessarily respond that quickly, and certainly to come in and sub um, because yeah, most of us are we do have other jobs. Yeah. So yeah. how we, how we manage that, I'm not sure, yeah. but uh, yeah, as much warning as possible of your absence. Okay. Well, well, as Councillor Adams said, we need to have that conversation and, and, and uh, yeah, Councillor Cushion, thank you. Uh, yeah, just follow up on, on, on the points we made. I mean, ultimately, I understand it's up to members if they can't make a, a, uh, a committee, then they should ask members of their own group who are the yeah. designated substitutes whether they can attend. But it comes down to the timeliness as well. And if you're getting it on the day, then that gives them very sure. little chance for anyone to be found. So yeah. I think we need to emphasize that as group leaders. Um, if you can't go, let us know soon. As not only if the group can't find a, uh, a substitute, then would it go to the chairman and uh, the relevant member of democratic services to see whether a substitute could be found from elsewhere. 
Yeah, but no, that's an important I, point, I think. Yeah it's, yeah, it's important that we work to, to, to try and iron it out. It's just noticeable, I think, since we've come back, that there's there's more of that going on. So if we can just do it now, we've, we've got a, a good start. Thank you. Was there anything else anybody else wanted to raise? I think um, Matt um, covered all the points that um, I wanted to make in there. So thank you for that. Um, Councillor Penfold. Well, I was just going to thank Matt for his um, support over the last year as well, because it's um, terrific and much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I second that. I mean, he's done, done two meetings with me, but he's, he's, you know, he supports me really well and uh, keeps me in line. And, and of course, talking of substitutes, I won't be at full council. <laughs> so Councillor Boyle's going to present it for me to full council. So thank you. <laughs> Along with, obviously, Matt will be so all right thank you so i think unless anybody's got anything else um go away we're done with that agenda item. Uh, you do just need to formally recommend that to full councils so you need a proposer and a seconder okay one. well I'm, I'm obviously happy to propose do i have a seconder um, did you get the name there uh, Boyle. yep that's fine thank you all those in favor yep unanimous thank you uh right just write it on there so we must be on item. Go away. Apologies. Nine, ten. Internal audit. <laughs> Miss Hayward, we finally got to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Faye Hayward, head of internal audit, although not for much longer. So I'd like to start off by saying um, that this will be the last time that I will present the progress and follow up report to the GRAP committee. Um, I have accepted another position at a London-based charity. Um, so I'll start off by saying thank you so much for your support over the last five years, both to members and officers. I have thoroughly enjoyed working with North Norfolk District Council to deliver the internal audit service. So sadness um, today, but definitely excited about the, the new challenge ahead. Um, we have recruited a replacement as well. So you, you can expect to uh, meet Teresa at our next meeting in, in December. So something to look forward to for you too. Okay, so the, the progress report today is nice and short and sweet. Uh, which is good for me. <laughs> uh, so at 3.2 of this uh, pack on page 106, you will see the progress made in delivering the 23-24 internal audit plan. So um, it's 16%, which isn't ideally where we would like to be at this stage. We'd like to be able to provide you the land charges report in final. It has been issued in draft and we have now received management comments, so it will be with you at the next meeting. Um, but the team of auditors have been working on finalising 22-23, and, and that has had an impact on our delivery for quarter one. We have also just concluded the post-implementation finance system work as well, so you can expect to receive that at the next committee meeting. So there's definitely a lot in progress, um, and you should see a lot more reports come to you over the next couple of meetings, so I'm finding that encouraging. The second part of this audit report covers any outstanding internal audit recommendations. You've got a summary table at page 109, which tells you the, the audit and the year that they were raised, um, and then the grading of those, um, P1 being urgent, P2 being important, and P3 being needs attention. Later on page 1110, you can see a latest response from the responsible officer to explain why the recommendation remains outstanding and they've also given a revised due date there so ordinarily i hand over to two members at this point and if you have any questions about that then please do ask thank you okay well i'm going to just start by saying thank you for the work you've done with this committee i know you've worked with uh, you know previous chairs uh, i'm obviously aware of you from when i've come to those meetings in the previous term and and how supportive you've been of the council worked with us to to develop our systems and we're really great Grateful and wish you the very best for the future. Thank you. You're very welcome. You. Okay. So, any questions? Councillor Cushing. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I must start by appreciating that, Faye. I mean, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you the last four years, and uh, you'll be greatly missed indeed. But congratulations on you, and I'm sure you'll be a, a great success in it. Um, 
If I might ask just one question, really, which is probably might be more chief executive, I suspect, and uh, might be letting you off a uh, in the last meeting. <laughs> um, if we look at the outstanding audit recommendations, I mean, we've got one which has been revised seven times, and others five, four, and three. I mean, if they've been revised seven times, what? Uh, it doesn't really give me any great confidence that they won't be revised eight, nine, or ten times. Um, so these are, this has been significantly improved for the position three or four years ago. There has been considerable focus on this uh, at a management level. Um, I can either take them individually or um, I can make a general statement. Um, in terms of um, the, fun, the first or the earliest one, which, as you say, has been revised seven times, the planning recommendation, that has been wrapped up in the planning service improvement plan, and I'm confident that that will now move towards um, completion, given the focus on that piece of work, which is to be presented um, again tomorrow in terms of the over and scrutiny committee. In terms of um, the civil contingencies, uh, that issue uh, has been the subject of um, delay because of COVID and the sickness absence of the civil contingencies manager. Uh, the, the, the critical issues and activities have been reviewed and I don't, in my view, present a risk. We are able to respond very quickly to emergency issues and the director of communities has that in hand, but the process needs to be uh, revised um, and will 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 be considered um, further. The waste management recommendations um, are, I think, um, are caught up in um, the wider anticipation of the government waste strategy uh, in terms of some of the objectives uh, that would uh, we would look to deliver, um, but I'm happy to take those away and ask Mr. Hems whether there is an opportunity to uh, complete those uh, in, 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 in a reasonable time frame, given that the national strategy is now delayed um, into an unknown date um, in, in the future. Um, in terms of the monthly, I think that is to do with the new uh, financial system but i will need to come back to you on that uh the penalty notices uh in terms of the car park contract we are undertaking a review of how that contract works for us uh, mrs stankley is taking that forward because it's a critical issue in terms of our uh, income uh, stream and uh, any sort of commercialization um strategy I'm not able to comment in respect of N2214. N I'll need to come back to you on that. And the corporate health and safety uh, is um, an update of the system uh, due to uh, a change of staff. There's a long-term staff sickness absence from the officer that has been um, doing that piece of work. Um, and so uh, that hasn't been given attention over the summer months. Thank you. Does that, yeah. i just come back on a couple of those, if I, I may. Um, the uh, one on the bottom of page 110, the civil contingencies one, um, is, the, um, is that being progressed now by an officer or is it still pending the person who has been off ill? Or are they back at work now? Or is that being delegated to somebody else to do? Uh, where I'm coming from, if we now got a revised date at the end of the year, but if the person's away, then... Presumably it's not going to be done by the end of the year. I don't, sorry, Councillor Cushing, I don't have any um, comment or knowledge beyond what is in the uh, response box. So it would appear that a questionnaire survey has been issued to service managers and have been returned and are now being worked on with the anticipation that it will come back to this committee in December. I will take that as a way from an action and confirm with you whether that date will be met. I, I have uh, I can add that I have spoken to the officer and it's their intention uh, when I spoke to them to bring it to December. One more. 
Um, bottom page 111, which I'd already mentioned as part of the minutes, is around the uh, monthly bank reconciliations. Um, given we've got a delay on that, should that not be upgraded from important to urgent, given that sounds like it has real monetary impacts uh, on residents or the council? Okay. I'm not sure it can be because it is part of that the audit report that has been published. So we can't change the grading of that. But in terms of the annual audit plan, there will be um, a risk assessment in terms of cash receipting and income to the authority. And because of the potential risk that represents, I think that is an annual or every other year audit, whereas some of the other audits might be undertaken on a three or four yearly cycle. So <laughs> God, if, if I may have another nibble on that one, if I may. Um, it, the, um, the due date is the 30th of September, which is what, I don't know, three weeks away from where we are now, just near enough. I mean, are you confident it'll be done by the end of this month? Well, that's the information that's been provided, yeah. Councillor yeah. Cushing, so I'm not able to comment further yeah. on that. Okay. We'll, we'll I haven't asked the question myself. Yeah. I take that in terms of what is in this in this yes. report. Okay. So I have to have confidence that that is the position. If it isn't, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Thank I, you. Yeah, I think future dates we need to. How's the Penfold? Yeah. Yes, just to come back on that, I think, I think it would be good to turn some of those intentions into certainties, really. Um, but, Faye, thank you for everything you've done. Fantastic, Faye. Uh, and um, a real loss to us, but um, I, I'm sure you'll be a huge success in your new role in London. So thank you very much for all your, all your hard work here. Um, not to be a pedant, but I will be. Um, just to ask a question, um, in paragraph 3.2, I think it mentions... We've completed um, 28 out of 171 days. Um, but just in Appendix 1, it then refers to 28 days from 176 days. So I just wondered, am I, have I missed something there? Or is that is that a little bit of a, a five-day no, slippage? No, that's fantastically observed. Okay. I'm very impressed. Um, we've retained five days for the Head of Internal Audit to carry out uh, consultative work on risk management processes. So TIA wouldn't be delivering that, therefore it isn't included within the percentage. But of the overall plan, yes, it, it is there for us to do. All right. Councillor Brown, could you just introduce yourself as well, possibly? Please? Uh, yes, my name is Councillor Andrew Brown. I'm the Cabinet uh, Portfolio Holder for Planning and Enforcement, and I represent the ward of Stoddy. Um, on, on the piece, it, what I hope will help us to deliver an improved planning service in the spring of next year when we complete that stream of work is um, the additional funding which is being, is being proposed in the uh, levelling up bill going through Parliament at the moment. So we're expecting a 35% increase in fees on majors, 25% on domestics if it goes through. Um, unfortunately, um, amendments to ring fence that funding for the planning services in each local authority uh, have been um, resisted. So we'll wait and see whether that changes or not. I do hope it will. Um, and the, the other aspect um, is that unlike fee setting in the building control department, we aren't allowed as an authority to set our own fees locally at a local rate, taking into account market forces locally. So that's a bit disappointing. But since we've raised or mentioned PSIP, um, I just thought I would make those two two points. It would be helpful if if the levelling up bill could be changed during its course through through Parliament. And I would just like to add my remarks to thank Faye for all her wonderful work and her support down the years. And I wish you all the success in the bright lights of London. And I've got to go in 10 minutes, Chair, just so that you know. Thank you. <laughs> OK, no, so, um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the planning service improvement plan coming tomorrow. I'll be honest to see that. It'd be good to see that move forward. 
And yes, it would be it's good to see uh, planning applications properly funded. You know, the fees that people pay does not cover the costs, and we're aware of that. So that would be good to see some of that come through. As regarding the ring fencing, we will just have to wait and see what's delivered there. But thank you for updating us on that. It's appreciated. Thank you. Um, and was there any? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank just one last thing, if I may say thank you for your kind comments. Okay. Thank you. Can I just pick up on a few little bits, if I may, then? I think everybody else has built out. So just, um, for example, some of the dates. So um, where we've got, we talked about the um, procurement contract management, which says um, the corporate business continuity plan will go to GRAC in December, um, that that is shown in the work programme. So at least if it's delayed, we've got a track on it. That would be good if we could do that. And I think there was a September date mentioned. I don't know if that's one that we can sign in that. If I could just ask you to review that and let me know. Thank you. Um, and yeah, there was one in there. Um, yeah, it was um, the environmental health one, which doesn't have a, a date or an update on it at all. We've got no response there. Um, so I don't know what the story is behind that one. It's only had two revisions uh yeah so i don't know is anybody else offer an answer why we've not got an update on that one thank you i think it may be one that we need to take away and and ask for an update to be sent okay. round after the meeting obviously we have made requests to to get sure. an update into the the paper pack um but we haven't had that so i think it wouldn't be unreasonable to send a, a note to ask for that and and to okay. forward that one if we could do that then thank you thank you very much um, so uh, what the final one is to do with the corporate health and safety. So we've obviously uh, got someone recruited and we're working on that. And we've also got the management system of Concerto. Um, oh, I just wonder how we know where we are at the moment. How do we know that it's health and safety? How do we know that the building is safe? Do we have procedures in place to say that pack testing has been done, fire extinguishers checked? Um, I don't know if anybody can enlighten me on that i just we know where we're going forward and that's good i'd like to know where we are now thank you it's a piece of assurance that um you would absolutely want to receive um as grac and um as we've kind of said before we've got the latest response here in in the paper um we hope that that will be resolved for the next meeting um but again i'm happy to take away a, a formal request to just say can we get a bit more information there yeah. Um, to tell a bit more of the story around that so you receive greater comfort. Yeah, I, you know, I appreciate that at the moment because it's only my, my second chair of this and, mm -hmm. and uh, I've obviously got questions where I don't have that history. And so, so I'd like to know where we are. So, so thank you. Yes. Well, so to give some reassurance, we did employ or we have employed, I think he started with us back in June, uh, a new corporate health and safety officer, mm -hmm. and they are working with the compliance officer across the whole of the council's functions. Um, the compliance officer was employed uh, as we have built up our temporary accommodation portfolio because the turnover of those premises by placing homeless households in temporary accommodation on a short term meant that there was a turnover of those properties where those necessary checks needed to be um, put in place. And so we strengthened the property services team with the compliance officers, I think, two years ago. And those two officers now are working together, but I'll need to check how that work is then carried forward into the reporting system. Yeah. But we do have officers in both the compliance officer and a corporate health and safety mm -hmm. officer role, and we've strengthened our resources in those areas in recent times. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so it's just comfort for me that we've got some sort of system that's been working historically to keep us there, and clearly it has. So, but thank you. All right. Um, do I, what was the, do we need to note this, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah, there's no formal recommendation. Okay, just a note the report. So everybody's happy with that. So, all the answers are great. Thank you. And, Faye, thank you again. All right. And uh, we'll miss you. Thank you. Right. So, agenda item 10, which is the local code of corporate governance annual governance statement. We've got a lot of our new statements here. That's apologies. Okay. Thank you. So, item. 11 we need. Chair, this is a standard report uh, that needs to be completed annually as part of the government's uh, governance and assurance framework. It requires both sign off by myself as chief executive and uh, the leader of the council. 
the document as prepared for this year is in front of you. I'm happy to take any questions that members might have, um, but it outlines the actions that we undertake uh, in respect of each of the uh, SIPFA standards uh, and then a formal statement which the, both, the, as I say, the Leader of the Council and myself need to sign off uh, for, for governance um, assurance um, and as part of the um, uh, annual audit process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Officer Bright, for filling that in for us. Appreciate that. Did anybody have any questions on this report? Go ahead, Christopher. Just a general one. Um, where does this actually go then? I mean, what? Who, who does it actually send to? Who needs to review? Is it central government? Do they? So we have to, we have to publish it. It's a requirement to publish, uh, and it um, it can be scrutinised on on that basis. I don't think it has to be returned to government, but I think it's one of those things that we have to be able to demonstrate that we have uh, completed, and it does form part of the um, audit assurance work that both internal audit and external audit undertake. Yeah. Thank you. Happy with that? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? So we're asked to review and approve the annual government statement along with, so do we need a proposal second? Uh, yeah, you will, yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to propose, anybody? Councillor Cushion, second. All in favour? We're unanimous for that, thank you. Man. So we must be on 12 now, audit committee and co-opted members. Mr. Jordan, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members uh, may recall at previous uh, GRAC committees, there's been some discussion about some guidance regarding having independent persons co-opted, independent members co-opted onto um, audit committees. Um, and I prepared a report in regard to this so that members can uh, decide uh, what route they wish to take in regard to this situation. So uh, as my report sets out, a position statement has been issued by the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, SIPFA, um, and it contains some recommendations in uh, that position statement, which I have uh, attached to the report at Appendix A. And in particular, um, it, uh, it uh, says that uh, a recommendation is that uh, local authorities include at least two co-opted independent members on their audit committees. Um, it's not a statutory requirement, it's best practice. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, something in the position statement regarding uh, that there should be an annual public reporting of compliance with the position statement that's been attached at Appendix A. So the kind of journey that this has been through, there's in 2019, there was the Redmond review, and that review uh, recommended that there be at least one independent member uh, attached to audit committees. And the reasons behind were essentially to ensure that the uh, audit committee has the necessary expertise to carry out their role effectively. And you'll see the position statement by SIPFA. It um, encourages that appropriate uh, members, as in members of the district council, are, are appointed to be on this important committee. Uh, and perhaps to strengthen that, the Redmond Review uh, wanted uh, or recommended that uh, a, an individual with sufficient expertise could uh, assist the committee with carrying out their, uh, their duties. Then in May 2022, SIPFA uh, set out their position statement, which uh, recommended that each authority uh, each local authority should include at least two co-opted uh, independent members to provide appropriate technical expertise. So just to underline again that this isn't a statutory requirement. It is anticipated that at some point in the future it may be, but at this moment in time, there is no requirement as such to have independent members but the SIPFA statement should be considered as 
best practice and um, it it would be something that would help ensure that uh, audit committees carry out their functions as expected. Um, I've then got, should, um, should the committee uh, consider appointing either one or two independent persons, and I'll refer to Mrs Hayward in a moment in regards to the, the guidance, um, I've set out that such a personal persons would need to be independent, so they can't be a member of the council or an officer, they should have a set period of time because the longer an independent person stays with an authority, the less independence uh, may be considered when looking at it from an outside perspective. Um, so I've set out some information in regard to how a recruitment process could potentially take place. So uh, with that point of uh, underlining that it's not a statutory obligation, um, I did uh, correspond, correspond with uh, Mrs Hayward in regards to wondering how other local authorities uh, dealt with the matter, because I've uh, I've recommended going along with the uh, the SIPFA recommendation, but there are other ways and other appropriate ways of doing so. So I wonder whether you would be able to assist at this moment. Thank you. Of course. If I may, Chairman, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I've produced a, a very similar paper um, elsewhere at the request of, of audit committees at other councils locally. Um, I think firstly, it's um, worth pointing out that on the second point of the recommendation that you report annually, on how the committee has complied with the position statement. In March, we have an agenda item called a self-assessment exercise. And that's where the head of internal audit will help to facilitate a review of the work that you're undertaking, the terms of reference, and included within that is a skills and knowledge framework where you can assess yourselves as a committee against that and understand if there are any gaps. Um, now it is there where I would recommend thinking about whether you would need to supplement your already existing skills and knowledge um, with a, a particular skill set um, so that they can really add value to the committee. Others have chosen to go that route locally. So we have Norwich City Council has one um, co-opted independent um, person on their committee at the moment. That's fairly recent development. They are looking for a second to supplement financial expertise. And then um, Breckland have always had uh, an independent person on their, their audit committee. And in both instances, it has worked really well to add greater depth to the, the conversation, if nothing else. They are completely objective. They have uh, no political ties at all. And, and it can really enrich the conversation that you're having at GRAC. Um, so I would definitely recommend incorporating a statement in your annual report that's been elsewhere in the agenda about the fact that you do the self-assessment exercise that provides full council with assurance that you are uh, reflecting on your obligations as an audit committee and as GRAC. Um, and then potentially to consider as others have going for one seeing how it goes and then maybe looking at another later down the line just as as the monitor officer says we we don't have an obligation to take this forward at this stage but it is looking likely that it, it will go that way it's also not clear at the moment how that will be enforced so um lots to consider and i think we have had the conversation before but it, um it's uh it, it needs to be revisited again after after the elections thank you Thank you. Are you finished as well? Uh, did you want to add? I think I will just add a, a okay. tiny bit more. In section six, there's the opportunity for the monitoring officer to add some extra information. And following on from what Mrs. Hayward has said, uh, one of the options, if you were to choose to go along with uh, one independent person at this time, and another later on, there are advantages of staggered recruitment so that we don't have two independent persons finishing at the same time. And there may also in the future be the possibility, I am wondering, to investigate uh, pooling arrangements with other local authorities so that we could possibly 
share, say, one of the independent persons or both of them at some later stage. Okay, thank, thank you. you for that. So, um, yeah, I mean, my experience is where there's independent people, um, they, they do add value. Um, uh, I, I see that the, the recommendation here is for two and a three year period. Um, if I'm honest, I would think initially because it's not, we're not required to one for a four year period actually. So it ties in and, and rotates with us, uh, our election cycle. Um, but I'm happy to hear views from all and, and to see where we land with this. Obviously we need to consider um, any financial implications as well. I don't know if we, was there something there? I missed it, I apologize. My I think I did yeah. give a bit of a ballpark yeah. figure in here. Right. And I'm just wondering where it is. I, I think okay. I think you may be looking at around uh, four to six thousand pounds per year so, ongoing for okay. two so, independent persons. So it should be affordable. We shouldn't be too too worried about that. Okay, how's the pinfall? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, was, uh, was that, I might apply. Um, yeah. No, um, <laughs> I can't. No, I, I do actually. I'm a member of the county council's um, audit and governance committee, and we do have two independent members there, and it works extremely well. I have to say so. Just to support that and back that one up. Um, I think putting it over the sort of the life cycle of the the parliament, as it were, of the council, is a good thing um, to tie that in um with with our, our four-year tenure and i'd be happy with one or two i mean that's i guess the advantage of two is if we recruit them at the same time then we we run run one training process for them rather than two if it's staggered which may save some money but yes i'm in support thank you thank you anybody else want to ask a question um i have some questions about I, I'd, I'd like us to nail down the costs I'd like us to identify what particular skills short for, because we're recruiting people. Clearly, this committee covers quite a broad breadth of subjects. Now, are we looking at somebody with financial skills, something with audit skills, et cetera, like that, if we go down this route? Um, who Actually, who does the recruitment would be another question I would have. Um, and where would we find them? Unlike the standards, um, independent person, obviously, is up with, I was involved in the panel. <laughs> Uh, with you and we found two very good people but we were looking for people with sort of legalistic uh, or legal backgrounds i understand there this is not necessarily a legal committee so i think i'd like to understand more about that uh, as well before we make a decision okay on that. no the, the, the questions that i i think um they're good questions um the uh i did write them down as well so the skill set i think we need to do some sort of an audit of ourselves um and i think yeah yeah, and Chair, if I may, I, I'm happy to provide the skills and knowledge framework, and it isn't all yeah. centred around financial. You know, there are other elements to it. Um, project risk, I guess you've yeah. got to think about the key objectives of the council and what it's going to be working on over the next um, term and actually Excellent. supplement the, the already good set of skills that you've got here in the committee. Um, I also have a job description that the others have used, so I can provide that as well for you to review and, and make sure that you're happy with that. Um, elsewhere, when we have recruited these individuals, it's been a mixture of uh, GRAC members and, and officers as well. So, yeah. um, but you, you'd obviously don't have to do it that way, but that's how it has been done in the other two instances. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. In fact, I think it talks about the recruitment process or potential ways of doing it. So what we're at the moment is, is just establishing, obviously we've had some idea of the cost, some sort of indicative cost of what it may cost for one. Um, so what we're trying to establish is, is if in principle we think it's a good idea, then we can recommend it to all council and we can then fill in those gaps. Does that does that help? I'd be in a position of saying I'd, I'd want to sort of suck it and see, and I think I'd want to start with one person and see before we start going down a road of two person. Which is why I, I settled on the one. I think, yes, yeah. we would need to see. I, I also do have questions, but again, we need to, to, to go through that process. But... Um, this is kind of once you make the recommendation, we can go down that process because um, there's no point doing the process until we've agreed that we're going to do it. Um, but um, yeah, so for example, the shared person, will they understand the different corporate priorities as well? So, uh, you know, there are still lots of questions around it, but I think the principle. Thank you. Go ahead. 
I'm correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't think you've got uh, it enshrined within the terms of reference in the constitution currently that you can have independent persons too, so that will need to be considered and changed okay, and put you. forward as a change. Thank you for that input, appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, do, do, do any other members want to, to comment? Yes, yeah, so I, I would, also, sure. Jill Boyle. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think Kepsi, it's gone, but Kepsi thank you, Dave, those online, sorry. Yeah, um, for me, I would I would suggest if we were going down to that, that route, it would be, I would be keen as to start with one and see how it goes. Okay. And uh, yes, I do think we need to look, look, see at job descriptions and how it, and how it works to get the most effective yeah. person for, for what we're doing. Yeah, okay, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've got to go. I'm not having my peer review interview in about two minutes time, oh. so I'm afraid I'm going to have well, a Well, thank you. Thank you for your input today. Always okay. welcome. Did, was there stuff that you needed to well, cover? I was going to have quite several questions on the risk report, but I have, maybe I'll look through them and send them through. Send them through. Uh, subsequently. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just, before, let's probably leave the subject before I leave the room anyway. Um, are we looking to bring this forward to the next full council, or are we going to do some... Even if we approve it today, I, I, I think if we if we agree on the level and we can make a recommendation, we'll still be call it as well, won't we? I just yes. um, yeah, and then we might as well take the full council to then agree it because we, as I've said, we can put in the, you know, we, we, it would need to be put in all the right places for us to be able to do it right. anyhow. Yeah. But without doing that, there's no point in doing the other work because it's officer commitment to something that we've not agreed. So. So before you go, are you in favour in principle of one, of one yes. and four years or? Uh, yeah, for, for the term of this administration. Yeah, well, if, 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 uh, yeah. My, my thought is if you do it in between, yeah. so by, by the time we've done it, we'll be another year down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So you keep that continuity. That, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank Sorry, you. sir. No, thank you. Okay, did you want to add anything? Are you happy or? Yes, thank you. All right, so, yeah. I would just say I don't think this is something that we could get onto the full no, council agenda for this time round. Okay, thank you. But at least if we get it in there, it's it's about getting the process started. I wanted to get the process started, and essentially we need to get the council to agree that, that they agree with us that we think it's worth having one, and then we can commit to to doing the work that will be needed around it. So if everybody's content with that, we need to write a new recommendation so as far as i'm as far as i understand you are recommending uh the co-option of one independent member for a four-year period yeah. and then the rest of the recommendations remain, remain the same as, as as it is yes yeah thank you um, sorry yeah. could i add and i think the recommendation to that the grant reports annually on how the committee has complied with the sit for position statement 2022 to include I think to the end of that, it should add to be included in the annual self-assessment in line with uh, Mrs. Hayward's recommendation. Okay, yeah. Did you get that? Thank you. I just wonder, sorry, John, um, yeah. if we shouldn't put for a four-year period, only because that will take us over, or we to put it for this administration, and then we'll get in line with the next four years, four years. So effectively, it will probably be three, three and a bit, maybe. I don't know. Well, my thinking was, and, and obviously open for discussion, if we, by the time we've gone through this process, it will be next year before we'd be recruiting. So it would be three year. years, probably. No, I think it needs to go four years, so that, that person keeps the continuity. That's yeah, I, I just think that would be tricky well, then, with a well, new administration. Then, at the same time as us. Uh, right. That's I think Mrs. Hayward yeah. has suggested that mm. the constitution needs revision anyway, which yeah. Mrs. Jordan is, is uh, proposing to bring back in any okay. event. And that's something that we can consider. And so I think we should take advice on that point. Um, I understand the point that you're making, yeah. Councillor Penfold. Um, I equally understand the position of the chair in saying there's a transition period. But if there was political change, there may not be confidence in the individual and all the rest of it. So I think I think okay. we should take some advice on that. OK, so. So uh, is everybody happy with the recommendation for one to go to full council at the next one that we can, and then we can then follow on the actions after, because that, we're happy with that, everybody's content with that. Thank you. So I'll, um, have you got the word in that? Do we need to read it out? Or... No, no. Okay. I, I think I'd like the word and... You would like the word yeah. read out. Well, okay. I just want to check 
Yep. No, please. Are, are you going to read that for us? So, did you want? So yeah. So we're, we're going to go with one and four, one but subject to obviously, if, if we can't do that constitutionally, mm -hmm. whatever, then we will go So just to clarify, the recommendation is to recommend to full council that one co-opted independent member be appointed to the government risk and audit committee GRAC for a four-year period delegated authority to be given to the monitoring officer in consultation with the chairman of GRAC to undertake, undertake recruitment arrangements. And then recommendation two is that GRAC reports annually on how the committee has complied with the SIPFA position statement 2022 to include how it's discharged its responsibilities an assessment of its performance and that such report be made available to the public and is to be included in the annual self-assessment. I'm happy. So, so, sorry, I'm sorry to labour this. Could you, after the four year thing, is there a bracket there subject to the, the point that uh, Steve just made? Because I just, I wouldn't want that to. The four year period. Um, subject, subject to, to the um, review of yeah. further, further advice. Yeah, subject something to, like that. Yeah. Subject to further advice is added in. <laughs> Are we happy? So you need to propose and second. Yeah, okay. So I'm happy to propose that. Do I have someone to second? Uh, <laughs> Jill, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Boyle. Sorry, I got there. Sorry. Um, there's all those in favour. Thank you. Yeah, it's unanimous. And also, yeah, I just was in agreement with that. Right. Okay. Is everybody okay? Because we've been going for a while. Um, we've got a few more bits, but if everybody's okay, we'll crack on. Thank you. Um, so we're now on. Uh, right, so it's going to be 13. Yeah, the corporate risk register. Thank you. Um, as, anyway, who's introducing? So this is a standard item. I think it's brought to you twice a year. It is updated by uh, the corporate leadership team. Uh, in conjunction with um, Helen Thomas, um, Policy and Performance Manager, uh, who's who's in the room. Uh, this is our assessment of uh, the position of the authority subject to a number of both external factors and issues arising within the authority. Uh, it takes reference to national economic context, um, issues around environmental and um, social trends and pressures uh, obviously we're now moving into the winter period um, so there's issues here around our ability to respond to emergency events and whether they would be concurrent with um, other issues uh, we believe that the risks are, are slightly reduced in that respect given that you know covid uh, is essentially now um, endemic and being managed through vaccinations uh, but if if there was to be uh, up an uptake in terms of uh, levels of infection. Uh, we may have to review our service delivery um, again in the coming months. We obviously have um, uh, civil contingencies arrangements for seasonal uh, storm surge events in conjunction with voluntary uh, flood wardens and statutory partners, both police, uh, His Majesty's Coast Guard, etc. Um, so, and then there's obviously an assessment about um, our financial risk um, as well. Uh, some of the uh, context may change in terms of the delivery of the levelling up and regeneration bill. We've heard uh, in recent times the Prime Minister come to Norfolk and make a statement around nutrient neutrality, but the delivery of that statement is dependent upon uh, the passing of, of legislation through the levelling up. Uh, and, and regeneration bill. And then um, towards the end of the document, there are a number of uh, corporate project related risks um, and in respect to the showing and leisure center in the North Horsham High Street Heritage Jackson zone. And um, they are, are significantly reduced as the projects are now largely complete. Uh, the Fakenham um, Highway Roundabout to enable the uh, opening up of the uh, Fakenham Urban Extension is still something that we wish to see taken forward. Um, but there has been some doubt around funding and a pause on that because of the position with nutrient neutrality. We are hopeful that that situation is now moving towards resolution. 
um, such that we can resurrect that project, but there isn't a revised timetable for that at the present time. Um, it's the, the reports presented to you for comment or observation or uh, asking the officers to um, uh, strengthen or amend any of the risks or mitigation measures um, as, as appropriate. But it's a live document and something that is continually reviewed and up, uh, updated and refreshed to reflect uh, the context in which uh, the authority operates. Thank you for that. Officer Thomas, did you want to add to that? Thank you. Yes, just one thing to add. There will be an additional corporate risk in the next risk register, which has just been assessed in terms of uh, achieving net zero, the risk of not okay. doing that. So you will get an assessment on that in the next risk register. And um, just a point of information, all of the information in this uh, risk register was all gathered during August and early September. So it's bang up to date. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK. Does anybody have any particular comments? No. Councilor Penfold. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for um, the update. You know, as you say, it's um, bang up to date. Just um, where, where it mentions direction of change, and we've got an arrow pointing to the right, just <laughs> that, that, that means that it's um, not going the way, or it's static? Or... It means the score has not changed from the last time right. it was okay. assessed. Okay. So, yeah, it's fine. It's it just, it just slightly confusing. Okay. <laughs> An arrow pointing right means that things okay. haven't changed, but that's, right. you know, as Thank long you. as we know um, what that is, that's fine. And um, I was just looking at the recruitment, and I've lost, I've lost the page for it, recruitment risk. Uh, forgive me. I'll just come back to that. So it's on page uh, 16 or 197 of the overall papers. Um, people resources. And just in the, the comments section there, I was talking about um, in order to remain competitive and relevant um, when recruiting people. Of course, it's a challenge in Norfolk and, and probably more so in North Norfolk. Um, we'll be procuring recruitment software. So could you just explain how that will um help overcome a challenge perhaps of geography and um other factors that might come in how, how what would the software do that um <laughs> if that's not too technical a question so what i thought we'd procured um a recruitment software that uh, is to move our um recruitment processes online away from um application forms to digital and the journey is then end to end okay. so people yeah, increasingly people are applying online we we were asking people to fill in a pdf form online but then that then needed to be uh manually adjusted and carried forward into shortlisting so i think the the dynamic nature of this is that you can register your potential interest you can complete your application in stages, but it doesn't actually come into the system until you've pressed complete. And then um, it's much more responsive to uh, uh, applicants. And then the automated process moves forward from um, selection and standard letters are sent out and then um, shortlisting. And then if a candidate is successful, that moves forward into the council's HR records. But I, my understanding was we'd already introduced that or piloted it, so I don't, I don't. We have, I've just checked that is an out of date comment, which is very unusual for that to get through. Okay, thank you. That's, yeah, that's about processes and obviously bringing us up to speed with what you'd expect yeah. with other like relevant um, authorities or okay. businesses. Thank you. And thank you. Anybody else got? Because I've got a couple of bits. If, okay, as you would expect. <laughs> um, so, firstly, in fact, talking about the, the sort of automatic processes, I, I didn't see anything in our procedures, and it's comprehensive. And thank you for that. You know, uh, it, it's, it, it, there's lots of information in there. But about AI, artificial intelligence, are we considering that? Whether there's any risk to the organisation? Is it reviewed? Is it thought about because we've got more and more automated processes that are in fact artificial intelligence um, from people having their phone answered for 
chatbots. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to know if we've considered that. I think there has been some initial consideration by the customer services manager, but I don't think there is any formal consideration being given to that at this time. Okay, so is that something that perhaps we could um, recommend that you might like to consider that? That would be useful, thank you. Um, is it something that's going to grow in all our lives? So I think we need to make sure we've got a handle on it. The other thing that's important, the other thing there's also the issue around efficiency and process, of course, and customer service and satisfaction. Yeah. And I think in the past, members here have been very keen on that personal touch and concern about our responsiveness and whether people get an automated message or a personal response. So it's something that we would need to discuss with elected members to make sure you're comfortable with any direction yeah. of travel. But in terms of efficiency, a number of authorities have uh, delivered significant efficiencies by moving to some sort of AI system. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not, uh, it's from the purpose of this committee, I, whether we AI or not is for the council and, and officers to decide within their respective areas. It's whether it poses a risk and I think we need to consider if it should be within the risk. Officer Thomas, thank you. Yes, but very much in the risk register, uh, information security in general is definitely being addressed. And I know uh, the managers in the IT departments are well aware of uh, the risks of uh, artificial intelligence and addressing that in their work and things like the risks of using chatbots and what you connect them to and making sure that we don't expose ourselves to additional risk. Yeah, yeah. so uh, 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 from this, the point of view of this committee is, is that we can just recommend that it's considered and, and I think that's probably the right and appropriate way of that. Right. Right, thank you. So that, that we'll, we'll put that in in the manual. The other one that um, uh, whether we want to consider, I've talked about it a, a few times now, about the simplification of um, financial reporting so that people can understand and grasp it better. And also given, um, it, it, as we've seen in the media with Birmingham, it was from historic accounts where they had a hole. We're looking today, we're still waiting to hear about pensions where there might be a hole. Um, so whether we're whether that is something considered already within the risk register, if you're comfortable with that, or whether it's something that we need to to highlight as a, a an additional thing. So um, I just I'm just make, want to make sure that we're looking at that as a risk. It is so. absolutely a risk. It's something that Mrs. Stangley is acutely aware of, and we're not in a position at the present time to worry about. Uh, having to make any declarations in terms of a section 114 um, notice. Um, we don't have the workforce issues um, and equal pay issues, which Birmingham um, City Council has, has um, obviously experienced, not only on the basis of scale, but our workforce is different. We don't have uh, many um, frontline direct employees in terms of um, cleansing school dinner service and those sort of issues as a as a district authority we also uh, aren't at risk um i think um DLUC published or, or a risk a, a register of um at risk authorities in terms of out of district investments uh, we don't have any investments in shopping centers or um accommodation where that would present um, a risk in terms of depreciating um, property values. There is reference in, in the document, uh, in the risk register to the overall economy. Um, we Cabinet has recently visited Fakenham and I think there is a concern at the level of retail unit vacancy uh, in Fakenham relative to other towns um, in the district, but we aren't, we don't have any Wilco stores in the district. We've obviously seen the closure of M&K in Cromer and, and Fakenham, and the Fakenham store remains vacant, whereas the Cromer store uh, has been successfully um, re-let. But given our the size of our town centres, we don't have the exposure to some of those national retail chains, uh, which may have um, overstretched themselves. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I'm sure that we, we, we're as an organisation recognizing that risk but it's whether um and i don't know the answer whether those risks would have been better controlled 
elsewhere we may maybe not see if people understood them better because there's there's a huge amount of data here in, in both the internal and external audits and the one thing that members are responsible for legally is a financial thing and that's why i keep asking this question about making it simpler we need to make sure they've understood it we can train but we're not all trained people so no so mrs stankley mrs stankley has I, put on that so mrs stankley has identified that in terms of the need yeah. for uh additional officer and member training yeah. in this space officer particularly around budget management because we aren't in the same space that we have been in previous years where there have been you know quite significant departmental or service underspends and so we've ended up with a year-end surplus last year we didn't end up with a year-end surplus we had um a deficit uh at year end um so you know there is greater attention being given to um budgetary monitoring throughout the year but obviously with a new council uh and 15 new members i think mrs stangley is cognizant of your desire for simplification around um that process and i think she will endeavor to do that but it is a complex issue so you know in terms of we can't make it simple and then miss the detail so it is about a balance but obviously mrs stangley is is new as a section 151 director of resources to this authority so she will is able to bring experience from elsewhere and i think is committed to uh, working with you to meet your needs in terms of increasing that level of understanding okay so thank you yeah I, I, i'll come to you in a second um that's a powerful it's just um is, is that if she's recognized that risk about the knowledge and levels and we've got training is that monitored within the reports do you feel as it already is do you understand what i mean if if, if we're saying that it's a risk is that risk reported no it's okay. not no, it's right. not reported as a separate issue at the moment in terms of understanding but um mrs stankley as the section 151 chief finance officer has a statutory obligation yeah. so uh she she will she's she is bound by her professional code of conduct under sipfa yeah. to uh provide advice to elected members and if you don't take that advice such that you place or deem to place the authority at risk yeah. um she would have a duty to report and you know where where authorities have moved into this position of making 114 declarations there will be a multitude of issues that have contributed to that I'm sure. and, and then there will be sort of an inquiry or investigation sure. or understanding as to what yeah. has gone wrong in those instances that's just that i want to make sure that we're understanding that risk that's all that we've, we've got it covered um yeah officer thomas thank you uh, there are three levels of risk assessed here the, the strategic level sure. risk, which are the risk categories, the corporate level risk, but there are a number of service level risks. And it sounds to me like, like that should be a okay. service level, level risk within finance for them to address and put in place things to control what would be bad decision making by members if they don't get good financial information. That's the yeah. actual risk, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to recommend it to uh, Mrs. Stanley that she adds that as a service risk to finance if that would be acceptable if that's if that's the correct route to do that council penfold sorry you wanted to come in yeah no not at all just going okay. back on my directional arrows actually yeah. and um <laughs> little green stars and um red red triangles and yellow circles and things it's colorful well it is colorful I, I i'm enjoying it but i'm just wondering um could we have a key so on page um 184 there is a risk scoring key i just wonder if we could have a risk symbols key or something like that just a simple um okay. unless there is one and i've ever, ever looked at it but it just help us help me anyway to understand what all these little purple question marks and things like that actually represent would that be right? yeah. answer yes <laughs> okay that's what we like thank you Done. okay thank you was there anything else so so if i could just go back to the previous one do we need to recommend is that something you were just doing internally for that lower level one that, that will be done so the only one we need to to um suggest to to officers is the um, ai yeah okay so do we need to propose in second uh yes yeah, so you're recommending to the section 151 officer is responsible for the corporate risk register that the an ai risk is added to the corporate risk register or considered yeah certainly. 
that they consider whether it should be added and, and then let us know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll propose that again. Anybody to second? Uh, Councillor Penfold, everybody in favour? No? Yep, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody, for indulging me. Uh, right, so procurement exemptions. Hopefully, this was just the one in there. Are you? Thank you. Thank you. Officer Jordan, thank you. Thank you. Um, our procedures set out how. Uh, officers need to go about uh, procuring work. Um, however, under those contract procedure rules, there's certain exemptions. And so that uh, GRAC has oversight of when those are granted. Every, every meeting I bring to you the exemptions that were granted in the last quarter. And as you'll see on agenda item 14, there was uh, one in the last period. Thank you. Any comments from anybody? No. Do we just note that? What was that? So noted. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. So we must be on fifteen now. The um, outcomes and actions list. Thank yeah, I, I think you referred to one of the actions that we need to follow up on. Um, Obviously, the, the first action there from item six, as uh, Steve has now shared that email with the wider committee, uh, we need to chase up uh, for an answer to see if the delivery date for the purchase of those additional waste vehicles has been confirmed. Uh, just looking through the list. Uh, I think everything else is, yep. is done there, unless there's any other questions. Anybody? Are we content with that? Thank you, Matt. So finally, we've got the work programme. Yep. So uh, there's been a few changes here. Um, it's been fairly fluid as, as a result of the delays to the yeah. annual account sign-off process. Uh, you will look to see there we had, uh, if complete, marked with the external audit results report. Uh, so obviously we have got that. Um, the signing of annual accounts will need to take place under delegated authority, which you will do late, later this week, hopefully. Uh, we should then receive that external audit letter uh, for 2021 in December, um, once that's all agreed. Um, and then moving to December, we've got listed there the draft statement of accounts for 22-23. Uh, it's hopeful, I think it's listed for, for March there actually, that we then might crack on with uh, the 2122 uh, audited accounts and uh, start catching up to um, to the year 2223 yeah. uh, to get back on track. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've got that civil contingencies update in planned in December, and there is the additional uh, report there um, that uh, the um, uh, resilience manager has suggested that they are are planning to bring to December as well. So I'll, I'll follow that up, add that to the work program. Um, I know we've got the risk management framework due for December as well. Um, so uh, we'll need to look into that. I think, Helen, you might be able to advise whether that's kind of due for, I know that might be impacted by the review of, um, of the performance software. I don't know if you can clarify that at all. No, I don't think so. I, I think they might have more information about that okay. than me because I think okay. uh, the auditors are going to be working with Tina okay. on reviewing the framework. Go ahead. Thank yeah, you. we need to to wait for the new head of internal audit to start, but um, very much would be beneficial to work together on that. Okay. And if any re revisions are suggested, then we can describe together to grab how that has been shaped, I think. So on track for December, but it, it may slip depending on what else goes on. And obviously, as, as soon as... Um replacements then I'll, I'll be happy to to catch up with them when they're ready i believe the meeting is uh, going to be booked in so that's please great. Look out that. i appreciate that thank you all right i think we're not there did you? yeah that's everything i had to say on the work program so unless there's any questions okay anybody no so thank you everybody for your <laughs> forbearance and and sticking it out today i, I know that's twice that I've, I've kept you here for a while but i think it's important as we, you know, certainly under my chairmanship, we get a grip and I, I understand more fully. So by doing it now, then as we go along, hopefully it will get easier. But thank you, everybody. So I'll close the meeting at uh, 10 past four.